Hey. How are you? Is it Jai? It's Jay. Jay. Hi. How are you doing, man? How are you, man? I'm all right. Nice to meet you. Sweet. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Here, I'm just going to make sure everything's good, and then we'll start. Uh, you can hear me well, right? Yep. Here, see, it's all working. Great. Um, I'm going to start three, two, one. What up? Um, I'm here with John Dwyer, uh, revolutionary in the garage rock scene, OCs, DOCs, whatever bunch of names, and yeah. a bunch of cool solo projects. And um, yeah, man. So I just want to get into it. But like one of the first interviews I read about you, we talked the it talked about Trout Mask Replica. <laughs> that, that's a hell of an album. Um, you said that you didn't really like it. Now that you've you know grown and matured and done a bunch of weird stuff, is it more your taste now? Um, that's a tricky one because that record is so, I feel like it's intentionally, uh, alienating, you know, I think I love Beefheart and I love the Magic Band. And honestly, it's not my favorite of the records. I I probably like it more now, I guess, but I rarely listen to it, man. It's like a very specific thing. I think, you know, the, the fun thing about that record is there's millions of interviews with like Zappa and him and in particular the Magic Band about the creation of that record where it was such a grueling process. And almost it seemed like a bit of a vanity project where Beefheart wanted to like out weird Zappa, you know, because those two were always in competition and kudos because he certainly did it. But it's funny because that record was also like a big inspiration to a lot of friends of mine's bands back in the day. Mm -hmm. So it always got it was one of those records that got quoted a lot to me. You know, I, you know, you're making me want to go back and give it another listen. So, and it's funny, I have my parents copy of that. So it's like beat to hell. I have the, you know, the version that my parents had from way back in the day that it looks like uh, they ate breakfast off of it, but maybe I'll go back and give it a listen and see if it's grown on me at all. You know, and that's, what's cool though. Like, are you a safe, safe as milk kind of guy? You know, that record? I love that album. I, you know what, my favorite records of theirs, honestly, are kind of some of the later ones in the early 80s. If you look up, and it, it always gets yanked off YouTube for some reason, but Beefheart played with a really good band uh, in like 82. Uh, I think it's might be a couple of the guys from Per Ubu, but maybe I'm wrong. But he played on Saturday Night Live in 1982. Oh, and, wow. and he's really thin and getting older. And, you know, it's before he passed away, obviously. But um, that footage is really good and the band just rips. And it's like so almost like proto-punk in a weird way. And that stuff to me really spoke to me. But it's still really hooky, really poppy, yeah. but always as weird as he ever was. He does like Ashtray Heart, which I think is a song off Trout Mask Replica, maybe. Yeah, I think it is. But, uh, but he does like a weird like this era that I'm talking about. That, that Saturday Night Live footage, that era of his band I really love. He's got Mellotron, Synthesizer, a uh, guy playing like, uh, you know, four string Dan Electro bass, just really like kind of punk. But, um, you know, I'm a huge fan. I was just doing another podcast actually, we were talking about, they were asking me about going to Japan, talking about record shopping there. And I was like, my favorite thing about shopping in Japan is all these bootlegs. And what I bought last time was there was a bunch of Beefheart bootlegs because they had, for some reason, had a pile of, early 80s Captain Beefheart live records. So I bought them all and some of them are great. Some of them are not so much, but <laughs> but yeah, that, that record is like so niche. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. it's like, do you like anchovies? And some people are like, sure. And other people are like, not at all. So it's like, a, that's a real specific one, you know? I mean, I, I love it. I, I Yeah. Um, what happened was for me, was one of my teachers showed me that record. Mm -hmm. I thought it was terrible. First listen, I thought it was so <laughs> bad. And um, I showed it to my friends and we we kept watching this like, not what channel but like i think it's variety someone made like a whole documentary about beef heart and about that album yeah and it resonated with me and yeah. uh, we, we loved it so much by the end of the year we bought him an original cd for him to have our teacher nice. of uh beef heart dude i That's love like, beef heart like you know what man i will say even though that record was not my favorite of all his work i respect the hell out of it you know what oh, i mean yeah. like obviously it's like a monumental work it's just I, I need to go back and listen to it again because it's funny. I love so much noisy stuff that obviously harkens from that, but um, to not to say I didn't like it might might have been me doing a little bit of a hot take there. I'm <laughs> sure, you know, they're all gonna come after you, man. Yeah, Beefheart's uh, ghost. Yeah, Ro <laughs> yeah. What's his name Robo or whatever the drummer's name was. I forget. But yeah. So you were talking. Uh, you talked about bootlegging. That's actually one of my questions. So how important do you think bootlegging is to uh, the music industry as a whole and especially to your work? 
Um, I think back in the day for me, it meant a lot more because during the early days of like tape trade and like the eighties and nineties, uh, that was really cool to get like a Slayer cassette tape of a live show, a lot of metal and punk stuff, you know, and there are, there's a guy who has a YouTube channel that I cannot remember the name of right now off the top of my head, but it's full of great punk bootlegs from the early eighties. It's just like people with a stereo recorder in the audience recording these, like, you know, there's a bunch of like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, I can't even remember the name of the band right now, but uh, there's a lot of good early punk stuff from the DC scene. Sorry if I swore. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just like, uh, I think it's important back then. Now it's more about now it's just like, you know, if, if you're in a public space, you're going to be filmed and that's part of the game. You know, I don't mind it at all. I, I you know, sometimes people put up videos of, of us that like, I'll be like, well, this actually sounds shockingly good considering it was probably a phone recording. You know, it depends on where they're standing in the crowd. We're a really loud band, but uh you know, it's just that's that's that is what it is now. You know, you're going to yeah. be filmed everywhere you go. So technically bootlegging, it, I don't really think is a thing anymore unless maybe if they're selling it somehow. But it seems like the commodity is so saturated. You know what I mean? Like live videos, like we'll play a show in Chicago and there'll be like 10 videos of it, up it on the next day. You know, with somebody like it just looks like this. It's just like a phone. Yeah, that's like a vertical video. It's hard to watch, you know, so it depends. But I do love a bootleg record, certainly like that's old one, school. Yeah. I'm a big fan of like bootleg vinyl. You know, you go on Discogs. I'll look up a band oh, on yeah. Discogs and look for a band I love because I don't know their back catalog. <laughs> And I'll see some cool looking releases on there and I'll click on them and I'll be like, this has been banned on Discogs <laughs> because it's not official. But honestly, my first move usually then is to immediately go on eBay and try and buy that record if it's been banned on Discogs or like try and maybe find a blog spot that's posted it or a YouTube link that has the recording so I can hear it because I think a little bit of the forbidden fruit quality of it is, yeah. you know, tempting to an idiot like myself. You know, <laughs> you always want to know. If somebody if somebody could commit it to vinyl they must have really liked it because it's expensive you know yeah uh yeah i mean i gotta I, honestly i completely agree i i think the the whole thing of bootleg case is so goddamn awesome you know like you have a mm -hmm. thing but i don't know i kind of agree with the tool mentality of no no videos like i right. saw tool on wednesday and they only they only let you film the last song and it was terrible like the last song when you, everyone's got their phones out and, and they just, do that on purpose yeah, and I hate it, man. I I really love the fact that they don't let you do anything. Oh, I thought you meant the song was terrible. I was like, because that no, no, was an no. idea. They'd be like, okay, you can film now, and then they do a terrible song. That would be hilarious. That's very tool, though. I could see tool so doing that. They don't. They don't take your phone away, though. They just don't allow. If you hold your phone up, you get in trouble or whatever. You get like. Oh yeah, they get the the security guard trying to light oh, on. Right, right, really okay. annoying. I've been to a couple shows the past few years, within the last five years, where um, whoever, like comedian or like, I think we, our friend opened up for Jack White and I went to that show and they oh, had, awesome. um, they had bagged people's phones, you oh, know? Oh yeah, I heard about that, yeah. And I gotta say, man, it's, it, it's, it's funny to like, uh, sort of commiserate with this old school thought that like you would meet people to show talk or actually enjoy the moment you're in. But it's weird to see a show where I saw people talking to each other and I was like, oh, shit, this actually does kind of work to take people's phones and like make them, you know, enjoy. I don't know if it was about bootlegging or more about like, you know, Jack White might have some distaste against people filming at his shows or whatever, you know, um, controlling the output or whatever. But it was I had a good night because of it. Like we just had a drink and I, I seriously like in between the time I noticed it most was not even during the show. It was in between bands mm -hmm. and the crossover where they were changing gear on stage and stuff. There's like that 20 minute lull where there's just a DJ playing and yeah. everybody in the crowd was just hanging out with each other. I think somebody even bought me a beer because they knew my band, but it was just oh, like awesome. meeting random people, you know, Yeah. it reminded me of what it was just like inevitably back in the day, you know, like if you were paying to get in somewhere, you were trying to like soak it up and have a memory. Now, obviously that's, you know, it's, it's impossible to fight it though. You have to like sort of go with the flow of things. If, if you're fighting it, you're wasting your life right now. I feel like, cause it's inevitable at the moment. Yeah. You know? I'm older, so I've already, I've already like, you know, I've already been like, okay, this is how it is. I'm just dealing with it, you know, like, and now I'm used to it, you know, it doesn't bother me anymore. So, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I like the tool thing, but okay. So, yesterday night, right? I was looking through my levitation, like, levitation um, has an Instagram, and I looked through it, and I heard that for Hoover 3, you were DJing. Now, I mean, yeah. how was that? I mean, that was fun, awesome. man. I love that band. Yeah, they were great. The, I can't remember who played in the middle, which is so rude. Oh, it was uh, Juju. 
yeah but, uh, the opening band that night was a band i never heard who were really great called um spoon benders they're great real heavy kind of like you know proggy garagey psyche but they were good they're good i liked them great drummer um it was fun man i like djing you know especially if it's friends bands i'm just like hang out and have a couple drinks that that club is nice too they always treat me good i've DJed there a couple times i just dj that abortion rights thing there like the week before and it was totally chill you know as chill as uh, an abortion rights rally could be <laughs> anyway but well yeah, yeah. but uh yeah it was fun it was a great show it's always always a pleasure with bert and, and hoover three mm -hmm. yeah it's They've been, I'm trying to get in contact with them because they're, I, they, I think they're one of the best new bands out right now. You know, I'll all put in a word for crazy, you. Crazy, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Bert's a nice guy. You would like him. He's super chill. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to do one more of my questions. And then, um, you know, there's an OC subreddit. And uh, yeah. I asked them about a week ago if they had any interesting questions for you. And I got way too many responses. Yeah. But there's a couple that I really resonate with that I think are some really interesting questions for you. So one more for me, and then, you know, I'm going to give some really weird questions from them. Okay. Um, Let's see. Okay, cool. I'm going to talk about improv. I, I really enjoy improv as a musician, as a violin. Like, whenever I'm on stage, I like to do improv. But you've done a couple improv records, and you've done, you know, you do. I'm sure you do improv on stage. How important do you think that is to your show, to the OC show? Um, I'm really important, honestly. I mean, that's like, you know, we've been playing the same, some of these songs we've been playing for, some of these songs I've been playing for going on 15, 20 years. It depends on, you know, the song, but, uh, you know, close to 20 years, some of them anyway. Uh, imp imp improvisation is always, if you leave a little wiggle room in there, it's always, sometimes it's like happy accidents. You know how improv is. I always like John Abercrombie, the guitar player's take on improvisation when they're asking him you know like what what's your how, what would you tell other people and he's like i don't know man and he's like oh wait i know like if you're comfortable you're doing it wrong he's like always try and do something you've never done before he's like that's the rule he's like if i catch myself being comfortable he's like oh, i'm just leaning on something i already know I, I can't believe you're a violinist doing improv that seems like a really hard instrument to me i've only picked one up like twice and that's an instrument that you cannot fake being good at oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. you're stuck if you're bad at it if there's no guitar you can hide it pretty easily but um, yeah, improvisation is really fun. It's like um, it's like anything else in life where you're just, it's very much a, a in the moment thing. Amen. And ideally, if everybody's sort of telekinetically linking together, you have these nice moments where you, you know, it's like peace, you know, and like yeah. everything is all the bullshit out there takes a back seat for a minute and you're creating something beautiful. And hopefully the people in the audience are feeling that same thing. And it's sort of like a cyclic, you know, a uh, spontaneous moment of peace. Beautiful, man. Yeah. It's... I didn't mean for that to be beautiful. <laughs> it's just kind I mean, of... it is, though. You got lucky right there, kid. <laughs> <laughs> with, with improv at live shows, like, um, I don't know, like Queens of the Stone Age, whenever they do improv shit, I mean, I'm just in it. Same with, yeah, yeah. I don't do much improv, but whenever you see this live shows and they're like really doing something new, I really, res I love it, you know? I think jamming's fun period even if it's yeah. it can be gratuitous you know sometimes it's for the people in the band of course we get bored of our own songs you know i think i think uh tom i mean we're all really kind of good at it at this point we've been playing together for so long but there are certain people in the band that I feel like crave it more than others and tom dolis the piano player yeah a key player is certainly one of those people who can sort of he's like this dude who can just jump in the fray of anything that's happening and like get in there he's like he's got like oh, you know man. he's got like sort of perfect pitch and you know so but he's also like the guy that'll jump in with a harmony he'll do like these bold moves where he comes in with, like on a sixth above everybody <laughs> and like descend to where you are it's it's always and that to me is invigorating and that that pumps new life into the music so certainly a lot of the records and bands i like from back in the day like velvet underground or mm -hmm. tradgrass auction are like you know even you know uh old psych bands were always jamming you know and that's always fun like i loved it when a when a studio record would come out and the song would be four minutes long mm -hmm. and then you'd see it live and then you'd be like was that 30 minutes jesus like you know so like they just take that all over and with it that's fun to me you know sometimes i remember it's funny now that we're doing these like sort of more punk songs mm -hmm. people are like i miss the long jams but i swear when we were doing the long jams people were like what the hell is this too long <laughs> you know like they're complaining so they're they'll always complain one way or the other you know I'm oh, yeah. gonna do what's right for you. I, I love the new punk stuff, but also, man, when you have a slow song and you're just like, 
we try and mix it up a little bit, you know. I and also, man, at this point, honestly, like for physicality purposes, the slow songs are for the drummers live, <laughs> just to give them a moment to take a breath, you know. Be like, okay, let's play this song, and Dan or Paul will be like, geez, thank you, you know. So certainly a good thing to have something in there that's not like, you know, the whole time. Yeah, man. Okay, so I'm gonna go into the the first. This is the top question on Reddit, and um, you probably expected it, but everyone's wanting another damaged bug album. Everyone's just uh, talking about that. Now. I am. I've, dude. I I have like forty songs. Really, I'm not even kidding. That are sitting in a folder, in my Pro Tools that have been dropped from tape. But the problem is, is I wrote all these songs with all these different drummers. A lot of good drummers I brought in. You know, Nick Murray, Paul Quattrone, Gal Laser, uh, a bunch of jazz guys, wild drummers. So it's kind of all over the place. And I wrote, you know, 30 to 40 songs over a few years and then just couldn't finish them. So I think what I'm going to do is start from scratch with just the beats again and ditch everything because the beats are solid. I know they're good. I've kept them yeah. for a reason. There's maybe like four or five songs in there that I can build from. But it's like Damage Bug was like always a project where I would like write a bunch of songs in a period. Yeah. And then the record would have a vibe and then I would be done with it and move on. So I wrote the Michael Yonkers cover record as a way to get out of the writer's block I had for that 40 song stretch, yeah. thinking that I would do that because that was kind of already written and it's an artist that I really love. Mm -hmm. And then I would be inspired to work on that. And I think what happened was COVID happened and I just never got back in there. But it is it is on the roster and I promise that it's like... I have like a list of five things that I need to sort out musically, artistically this year. And that is hopefully going to be like at least getting the ball rolling again of like stripping it back down to just drums and starting from scratch and like make, maybe making something wholly new. I would love to make another poppy record like uh cold hot plums or something and like mm -hmm. get a real like hooky, but OCs has been taking up a lot of my time too. And the older I get, I, I feel myself slipping into just wanting to sit on my ass sometimes <laughs> nothing you know and like I, mean, I already like, feel that as the, yeah i know i know young people who are like man i want to do that all the time and i'm like well there's gonna be plenty of time for that later but yeah you know man i'm a workaholic so i plan on fixing it i want to do it I, I have it in my i have the title and everything you know hell yeah man i'm gonna say it here <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> but yeah i I loved the damage drug albums like an awesome Thank side project much. And I mean, like 50 other people did too, at least on the Reddit who saw the question. I would love to do it live sometime, but that's, that's just yeah. I would, yeah. I would pay $30. I would, love to, I would love to do a handful of shows like it. I mean, it, it wouldn't be impossible. I think I've said this before in interviews, but if I was going to do it live, I would kind of just want to sing and not actually play anything and have a band play all the music I've written. So That'd I could be just. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, so cool. just do, do it weird, you know, do it Bowie yeah. style or something, put on some, put on a wig and get in there, you know. Yeah, oh yeah, like put some, <laughs> uh, an amazing gown, awesome. you know. Yeah, yeah, that's a, one of the big things was if you go on tour, if you go on tour, you got to come to Atlanta, man, you got to come to my state, you got to come to I'm my a state. fan of Atlanta, uh, everybody loves hot Atlanta, you know, if so. It's the last date on your um, U.S. tour, I'm going to try to catch that date, we'll see. And we're playing with a good band from there, the Upchuck band, I don't know if you've seen them, but you'll probably dig them. They're tough. Sweet. Yeah, I'll check him out. Atlanta. Good Atlanta band, yeah. I think Ty Ty Siegel just produced their last record too, so shouldn't be too hard to find, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, another thing that people talked about is they asked a lot about set lists, and they, in the nicest way possible, they wanted them to be more varied. And because I mean, you guys have a fuck ton of albums. Yeah. Excuse my language. You guys have a load of albums and a load of, you know, projects and everything. So. I mean, why not? Is well, it well? My take on that is that again, this is this falls into one of those per like you know windows of uh, there's always going to be somebody complaining. So the reality is, is we have like 500 songs, but I think you know it's funny because people are always like, you know, hey, why don't you play more li new songs live or whatever or old songs? We did that all through COVID. We did four full live shows of all shit we've never done before. I, we had to learn stuff from the 90s that I'd written by myself mm -hmm. for those, you know, levitation things. Um, so there's that. But also it just takes time, man. And and honestly, most of these songs that these people want, because everybody's got a different favorite song, they don't work live. You know, like we've played them live. We have done them at one point or another. And it just the audience, you know, some guy would be like, I want this. And then we would do it. And the audience would be like, <laughs> and I'd be like, Let's never do that again. So basically, the way OCs works is 
we bring the hits that we have, you know, like the songs that people recognize that they can get into. And then, I mean, honestly, every tour, we've been adding like five to 10 new songs every yeah, tour. So I don't really know what people are talking about. These are just people that are like, you know, it's so easy to go online and be a bitch and complain about <laughs> stuff. So that's a little boring to me. Um, but, you know, we always we have so many songs. It's really tough. We can't just like flip the entire set and not play things like the dream or tidal wave. We just can't do that. Awesome. You know, It's not going to happen. So yeah. if they don't like it, they don't have to come to the show, I guess. Ooh. But really what it comes down to is my ideal situation is every time we have a new record, we do two to four songs off that record, get added to the set. So at this point we have like a 30 to 40 long set, song long set list, awesome. you know, but I don't think it's going to get, you know, it's just, it is what it is, you know? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I honestly agree with your take. People are really scared behind their little you know, avatars and there's a curtain yeah. behind you. you can I say think what they should do off. is take a year off from us and then come back. If they don't like <laughs> hearing it, just take a year off, stay home or go to a different show. Oh, I'm totally, back. I am absolutely okay with that. I do think that taste is a very subjective thing and I think it's okay to take a break. You know, this year, in fact, our tour, we're switching up some cities and dates to do some more uh, B market kind of smaller towns that we haven't played in a long time because I realized we got... You know, on the same tip that you're talking about with the set list, having, you know, like 80 percent the same songs we've been playing for years. Um, we're trying to mix it up with the cities now, too, because we've been playing the same places for so long. We get stuck in these little ruts that are convenient for us. And then, you know, we also get a lot of people much like the set list. We get people like, why don't you come play here? And I'm like, well, because nobody wants us there or we're not, we don't get paid to go there, you know. So we're making a conscious effort to sort of you know, dip into more of that. And I'm excited for it. We've actually, we just played Salt Lake City, which we haven't played in ages. Oh, yeah. And you know what I mean? So it's like, just gotta, everything, everything takes work. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I don't want to do work. Uh, yeah. Nobody wants to do work, man. That's why it's not called fun. You know, that's what my mom would always say. She was right. Yeah, really, she, she really is, honestly, man. <laughs> I mean, when you're in a band, you get to do the fun stuff. I don't, that's I know, I know. I'm really, I really am very lucky. My life is not, not hard. You know, I'm not, it's not like I'm like swinging a hammer, although I've done it, but you know, it's not like I'm, you know, having to like fight fires all day or anything. It's like pretty, you know, being an artist is, is, uh, if you can, you know, pay your way doing it this way, congratulations. Cause it's a tough industry, man. There's not a lot of room and everything is so saturated and inundated. Yeah. There's so many bands out there, you know, it's like so many hungry bands. Yeah, to me, it's always amazing because, you know, again, taste is so subjective. There's so many great bands out there that I'll never know why they don't do better. Like, I'm like, how is this band not huge? And then I'll see something that's huge. And I'm like, this band is terrible. So it's like, I'm really opinionated. But honestly, it's like, it's funny to me, like what people like is like to me. And I feel like partially this way for us included in this whole thing that I'm talking about is it's just, you know, there's the there's work. And there's like, sort of like, I guess, privilege for lack of a better word, but then also luck. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you just get lucky and, you know, I've been in the game for a long time. I used to play for nobody for years. Yeah. We would go, we would show up. I remember one time Coach Trips showed up in New Orleans and there was just nobody at the show. And we're like, we're going to play anyway. And the bartender was like, no, really? <laughs> like he was bummed. And then two people showed up and we played just for them. And they were a lot of fun, thank God. That would have been awesome, you put your time. Yeah, there were, it was actually the waiter and his boyfriend from the restaurant went to early <laughs> and they got really drunk and they were great. But, you know, I've been in it long enough to not say it's it's 100 percent up to luck, but there's certainly been moments in my life that we've uh, gained some footing just based on being there. You know yeah. what I mean? Having, having been in the game for long enough. and not becoming Internet famous quickly, which I think is probably great financially but at the same time it seems like a real detriment to uh integrity and your character and also your psyche you know like i feel like these people yeah. these big pop stars get huge really fast and it seems like they're like you know i've sometimes i'm like this guy's 17 jesus that seems exhausting to me you know like <laughs> like too much too fast and then being like burned out especially with like the way the internet is and social media just being inundated it's it's, it's tough yeah. it's a tough business man yeah it's you know, you see all these um, like rising stars get massive on TikTok and YouTube and shit. But I don't know. Is it really? Is that wholesome? Is that sustainable? Like with Dave Grohl saying that the only way you can, you know, really get yourself out there is play live. And what, what more I, 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 I can't believe I'm about to agree with Dave Grohl, but I would say that that's <laughs> right. You know, I, I don't have anything against Dave Grohl, but I, I also agree with Taylor Swift that artists should own their own rights. You know, I feel like yeah, labels owning people in perpetuity is certainly an archaic 
thing that we should put behind us. It's a bad yeah. model. Things like, but also with streaming platforms, underpaying artists, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. It's like, I have Spotify or bands on Spotify only because the fans wanted it so bad and I would get hassled all the time about it. But I personally don't have Spotify and I watch stuff on YouTube. I usually own both vinyl and digital. Not everybody has that option, but uh, I do know that the way they pay bands is just terrible. You know mm. what I mean? It's like, it's a terrible uh, model that's been set up and it's just, but again, it's one of those things I was talking about earlier where you just have to get, join the flow because fighting it otherwise is sort of a pointless battle you know we're headed in this direction and yeah. i think it would take a lot for you know one person to change it at this point I that's know. what i mean it's it's, it's messed up man because there's all like for me it's like i listen to a band like sprain right and they're crazy and they're heavy and they're sad and they're too much right and how are these guys not big they break up like a month after their album and i'm sure there's other issues with them right that but happens all the time man it's got to be Spotify, not, you know, it's got to be some, it's definitely. Uh, I don't know if m money doesn't necessarily fix things, but it certainly makes it easier. You know, I worked jobs my whole life. You know, I grew up, my family's pretty blue collar. Uh, mm -hmm. So I grew up working from a very young age and I always had jobs up until I didn't need to anymore. But th there's certain things I miss about having to struggle a little harder. Like definitely about like, I remember back in the day, I would like every time it'd be rent, I only paid $300 a month for rent in San Francisco, which is insane. I know. Don't even ask how that was just a <laughs> long story, but, but at the same time, every time rent came around, I'd be like, well, I gotta go sell, sell my records. And I would like take records to the record store and sell them to make my rent, you know, or shit like that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, certainly I would say that, you know, struggle makes for good art and, definitely the way the world is right now there's plenty of struggle like everybody has felt the pinch for the past decade i would say and i think i've said it a million times but i think it's a great time for art because everybody needs a breath right now and a little bit of an escape so things like if you're making music great if you're making visual art great films you know whatever you know so it's just i don't know how i got on this path sorry i'm blathering no, awesome I, you, know what I, I mean? you know what i mean it's like it's, it's a weird time to try and break into show business you know so I mean, if anything, though, it is the best time because everyone's feeling like I've gotten into more depressing albums. Everyone's kind of sadder songs. And mm -hmm. I don't know, longing for that rush of seeing OC, seeing whatever the hell you see, seeing right. them live and seeing your people. And I think that's much better than I mean, phones. And there's a yeah. disconnect that I feel at least. I, I commend know. Tool for, for uh, only having people film their last thing. We don't really have any sort of rules about that. Yeah. But I, I really like the idea that I inadvertently heard you say where you play a terrible song when it's time to film. Like, uh, you're like, okay, now everybody take their phones out and you do a bad cover or something. So <laughs> funny, bro. Like, you we just get in touch with Tool and tell them, like, just saying this is a pretty good idea. That the only videos I'm that I have you guys are you guys sucking. <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea. Baby, you hit baby Justin Bieber, but only like completely terrible off key. Yeah. I would. I, honestly, that's yep. that's an experience. Right on. So, um, film, right? You talked about, you know, we're going into the new music. Film's mm -hmm. important. Arts, you know. But people are talking a lot about soundtracks, and I'm not the only one. Everyone wants to see you do a soundtrack. We've all these big. Man, I would love to. It's all I want to do. I would love to do. A, I would love to work on something feature length that I was really, um, that I really felt uh into that i put my heart into i would love to work with score i would love to work with symphonic stuff you know it's <laughs> amazing band I, mean, I, I would really love to i i just did a little bit of music for my a friend of mine short which was just his you know it's a guy that i worked with who's done some videos for us he did the uh the goon video with the weightlifter recently oh, oh yeah he made a he made a as you can imagine a pretty out there short and it was really fun to work on we got together and we picked out sort of the palette of sound so it was like vocals drums but like just vocal and drum samples no like real quick sang sang stuff mm -hmm. and uh synthesizer and strings and it was really fun for me to do it and i'm looking forward to hearing what he ends up doing with it in the end but yeah if you uh if there's any directors out there who uh, <laughs> want this to work on your film i'm all about it i really am a lot of this stuff that has moved me in the past few years has been film soundtracks you know things like uh the guy that works with ben wheatley on field in england mm -hmm. The girl that did uh, Under the Skin, even, dude, uh, I just saw The Killer, the new uh, Fincher film, and Trent Reznor and Atticus, their yeah. soundtrack for that is so good. It really, and then the other end of that, the other end of that soundtrack was The Smiths, which is pretty hilarious because they're polar mm -hmm. opposites, but it really worked, you know? So 
I've been seeing a lot of stuff lately with great, great soundtrack stuff, you know? Yeah. And to me, I'm a huge cinephile and I, I adore a good soundtrack, you know? I just bought the vinyl of uh, Chopping Mall, which is a fun 80s slasher flick about robots going nuts in a mall, which That's actually awesome. to me seems a little bit like a precursor to Robocop in a weird way. I love but it has a great, like, great 80s synthesizer soundtrack, real fun, you know? Totally yeah. ridiculous. Worth checking out that film. I think it's up on some of the streaming platforms. Thank you, man. I'm definitely going to check that out. Chopping Mall. Come on, that name alone. It was like that movie was written by somebody coming up with a title first. So like, Chopping Mall. Now write it. <laughs> you know, so. all, all the weird like um, 80s movies, we can tell. Small budget, big ideas. Like, yep. Sharknado. Sharknado is something like A 80s. lot of drugs. Love Sharknado. In the 80s, you know? Oh, yeah, Sharknado. That's, that's <laughs> Sharknado's from like the early 2000s, though. It but, it's got that same vibe. I would say about that, that it harkens back to the 80s. That's another, yeah. what you're saying is like a, a grand idea, a ridiculous idea that probably shouldn't happen. And somebody's like, let's do it. And they do it exactly as they should, where it's like totally just gratuitous and ridiculous and like pedal to the metal, you know? I mean, honestly, when I'm, you know, that's, I think that's the best for everyone, when, especially when you have the scene. Um, people, people, music's getting more disinterested. Movies are becoming more boring. I, I don't really want to say that, but you know, when there's more, I understand that. I agree. Yeah, you don't, be, you don't want to be a naysayer to uh, the new wave of cinema, but it can be, you know, especially like bigger budget films can be really droll and boring. You know, I, I, this year though has been pretty good. I've seen a lot this of stuff. Really better than usual. I really enjoyed I've, it. I, it's true. We've have it always is kind of cyclic like this. Like every now and then you'll have a year of just like damn, there's a lot of great films came out this year, you know? So hopefully that that trend continues. Usually it's like independent to like mid-level stuff, but I've seen a lot of good stuff this year that I've really enjoyed. So we'll see, you know? And there's some directors that I like coming up with new films coming up that I have high hopes for. But I've also been, as usual, incredibly disappointed. My new thing with movies, honestly, is to go in without watching the trailer. Like my friend's like, we should go see this. And I just was like, don't tell me anything. I just want to go in naked and like, hopefully it's great. And if it's great, it's like even more of an experience because it's like a surprise. But that also backfired on me hideously the other day where I went to see a movie and I was like, I hate this. I want to leave. And <laughs> we got up and left in the middle of the movie, which I never do. I can watch any piece of garbage. And I was like, I have to leave this movie, you know? Is that bad? But, yeah, it was bad. It was, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't even say, but it, it doesn't really matter. It was that movie ISS about the International Space Station. And it was like Russia and America mm -hmm. bomb each other while their compatriots are up in the sky. And it was just, woof, it was rough. <laughs> and it was, seemed like something I would really like, but I was like, this yeah. is terrible. I, I ironically did really enjoy, and I didn't expect to, The Beekeeper, the new Jason Statham film. I that that, yeah. Be, absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. But I went with a bunch of friends of mine who were kind of ding-dongs, and we laughed a lot. <laughs> but it was, it was like the crowd was really fun because the movie is completely asinine. It was like the director was like, Jason Statham, I know exactly what we need to do with him. We're going to make this ridiculous movie. You know, kind of like what you were talking about with Sharknado. But a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit less extreme, but still like really <laughs> fun and silly. So we'll yeah, see. I, it's out. The, I, I saw the beekeeper. I saw the trailer, but I don't know who. Would, it's I, it's, it's ridiculous. At one point they say he's like a 40 year old guy. You're like 40. That guy's like 50. <laughs> at least. I was like, what the hell? And my buddy was like, I think it's in his contract that you say he's in his 40s. Like he's lying <laughs> about his age in the movie. I was like, come on now. But yeah. OK. Um. Awesome. Uh, one thing people really talked about, like maybe third most, was Castle Face. And you guys reissued new albums and stuff. Is there any update? Are we going to get any more new, weird, small albums? Yeah, Castle Face is coming back. Uh, we just had a hiccup there, but everything's sorted. I, I own everything. It's just me. Uh, I'm definitely going to simple, simple. What's that? That's a lot, though. Like all in one person. Well, this time around, I've re reorganized the label so that it actually runs way simpler as it should have the whole time. This is a long story that I'm not going to go into to bore you with right now. But basically, Castle Face is back. Phoenix from the Ashes. I put out Ritual Habit Ceremony on it. Uh, the new OCs will be out on Castle Face. There's some other stuff coming up that I don't want to disclose here because it hasn't been announced yet necessarily. Yeah. But there's a couple little nice things coming out early this year and mid-year. But it's going to be much slower. And I think going forward, much it's going slower. to be mostly OCs related projects. So it'll be stuff. That's awesome. Uh, it'll be my projects only because it's just much simpler than, you know. Uh, the funny thing about a label is it's ex extremely expensive and yeah. uh, time consuming, but also really easy to like put out a record that doesn't make any money. Even though uh, this is another example of where you're like, I believe in everything we ever put out. Great bands, great records, tons of them. 
And, you know, ba- we put out a record for a band, they'd break up immediately, and then nobody would buy the oh, record. Yeah. But the record's still great, but it's just like, you know, exactly. it's, it, so from here on out, things are going to be run smoothly and simply, which is the key to business, mm-hmm. I think, is try not to overextend yourself because everything's so expensive all the time, you know, like things are nuts, you know, but, Honestly. but castle face is back and uh, I'm going to make it right. You know, you said a new OC's album. I mean, intercepted message was awesome. I love like it's it, his Viagra voice feels with the, the synths oh, and um, all the weird stuff. All right, so are we, we're getting a new album soon then? Is that what you're saying? I just finished making the demos for it and I sent them to the band today and we're going to start rehearsing next week. So we'll get awesome. the band versions of these demos hammered out. And then I'm hoping to record in March, realistically sometime in March. And then we're going to go from there, but it should be out typical. We have the same sort of schedule with that, which I'm okay with usually around August ish. We'll start releasing singles or whatever, you know, so yeah. right around into summer, Hopefully, we'll have a record out midsummer, end of summer. And is there anything you can say about it, or is it still under the? Um, I have too many ambitious ideas about it, and we'll see. I'll know on Monday almost right away whether the ideas I have are going to work or not. But it's going to be a little different as always. But it'll still sound like OC. So it's like we've always been, where it sounds like us, but it's different. And I think this this will be a culmination of the past few years of sounds all sort of congealed into uh i would i can say this i would describe the new record so far the demos that i made as extremely boneheaded so (laughs) they're very uh it's sort of not like foul form you know like boneheaded but uh we we did so many years of like complicated music that i'm just veered away from that in such a hard way that i just want um hooks you know what i mean i want hooky fun stuff and i want the crowd to have something to grab onto i want verse chorus verse a bit you know i'm always going with my whim and that's what i feel right right now is i just want you know our version of a pop song which is always a bit off but you know what i mean i I know i know when i get off this uh call with you i'm gonna go straight to listen to trial mask replica i wonder if i can make it it's like it's like a challenge like can you listen to the whole record you know honestly i mean but if you have good stereo headphones and you know you really dialed in i don't think i've ever listened to it on headphones man do you got it? I, I um, okay. went to my local audio store. We only have like one massive audio store in Atlanta, which is Hi-Fi Buys. And I um, I bought like, I spent all my money last summer and bought like 200 buck headphones. Nice. Um, and they are awesome. They Dude, are. Dude, I would say good headphones, worth the investment. Having a nice pair of headphones. Yeah. Sure. Especially if you're like just chilling and listening to music, man, certainly. And it's probably the best for like noise when I'm listening to noise albums and, and the punk and especially like jazz too. But when I'm listening to punk, you can really hear everything. And I love that. Like you can In the hear middle it. of your head. Yeah. 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 yeah certainly. Sure. Okay. So uh, I, we only have two minutes and 31 seconds left because I can't buy zoom premium. Okay. <laughs> Just it's, hit it. Hit me with what you got. So we're going to get the last one. I couldn't do this last time because it cut out on me, but this time we're going to do it. So I need you to give me three songs, albums, sayings, whatever the hell you want that can change someone's life. That is like the the big ones. Wow, three. that's a that's big ass. Time. Oh, man. Two um, minutes, man. <laughs> yeah, two minutes to think it over. Well, um, I don't know about changing your life, but I, I can tell you the things that I've learned over the past few years that have helped me personally, because everybody's different, you know, and I'm, like I said, I'm a bit of a workaholic, but I think certainly slowing down a little bit and taking a minute to like actually take a breath and look around you and enjoy the things you have, the people that you love, or even like it's something as simple as a beautiful day is really nice. You know, my dog was like breaking my heart this morning, just sleeping next to me in bed. And I just had a moment where I was about to get up and do all my shit for the morning. But instead I was like, I'm just going to take a moment and appreciate the dog because he's being hilarious, you know? So that for me, you know, that comes with getting older anyway, but you do, sort of have to like soak up these little moments because everything is so hectic and you're getting just like smashed with shit all day long right now to have a moment of peace is really nice um i read now more than ever so like that certainly if you're into you know reading about people that fascinate you that's certainly a way to go with uh finding things for yourself that help you along and also man like you know the mind is happy when the body is too sometimes so i find like uh trying to be good to myself physically and like doing things like, you know, you know how it was during COVID where everybody'd be like, I'm going to go for a walk. So they wouldn't go crazy. So like, I think that sort of echoed over into my daily life now where like, I'm trying to like work out every day, whether it be going for a bike ride or whatever. And like that kind of stuff really 
sets me in motion. So on the road, for instance, on tour, mm -hmm. we, you know, we always try now to find hotels with like, okay, nice gyms, <laughs> go for a run. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't want to cut it off. I wish we could keep okay. up some more questions, but man, we don't have much time. So I'm just going to, I don't want you to cut off while you're talking. So mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Thank you so much for joining me. I know this was a little bit of a gamble on your end, and I really appreciate no, it. No, it's all good, man. It's nice to meet you. It opens more doors for me. Hopefully, I'll get to go to the um, OC show. It's no, if you want to come, hit me up. You got the email. Hit me up before the Atlanta show, and I'll get you in with your pop or whatever, all right? Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah man. that's all what right. we're trying to do. But um. Yeah.